Uh, so the tech talk went pretty well last night, with the exception that Marcus's mic wasn't working very well the whole the whole time. Well, but even within, like uh, he's kind of a low talker in person, yeah. so I feel like his mic just wasn't picking him up very well. Well, yeah, but but even during a conversation where he was quiet, then all of a sudden it would be loud again because yeah. he would like swing in or something. I don't know, but whatever it was. Uh, you could roughly make it out. And this class had pretty decent voter turnout. Um, about 40% of this class attended. The other classes were um, pretty disappointing in terms of their if we had 8% of 200 show up and um, no, 7% of 200 and 8% of 300 show up. Yeah, I saw the chat they got here, but what, what like one person? It's a, it's a deep one. I was there. Who was there? I just sent that link to all of the others. <laughs> Oh, you sent it to everyone? Yeah, I know you were there. Oh, oh, oh. I, I thought you were just, I only noticed, I thought you sent it just to me. Also, oh, did Blade send it to you again? No. Okay, cool. Um, I sent it to Blade. I think he like misunderstood. I thought he misunderstood what I said. I put a little message that said, like, thanks to all the professors. And he was like, okay, I'll do that. And I was like, oh, he's going to send it to the rest of the professors. Well, didn't you send it to me in a private message directly? Yeah. Oh, well, so how was I supposed to know you sent it to everybody? I don't read that crap. I just saw that you gave me an attendance sheet. I gave you a note about it too. So, well, I don't believe you. Well, you're the guy that was defending the uh, the dangerous dungeon salesman. Yeah. With that analogy, would you, would you believe me if I sent this? No. Oh, okay. well, you were there. Yeah. Like I said, this class, I mean, it wasn't good enough, but it was better than the other classes. And especially since most of you are already, you know, you're either juniors or seniors and you're starting to look for your jobs. And this place is well known for hiring uh, Concordia students. So probably would have been a good idea to, to be there. But such is life. All right, we did not have homework for today, right? We finished up our let thing. So uh, next thing to talk about, uh, we really have two choices. And uh, um, I don't care which one we go with. Uh, so we can, um, let me just get down to where we last left off. Just do everything above this. I get confused when I try to use old. Yeah. Well, because it comes into my head, I want to put it on there, and then it's, I know it's later on, but I just keep keep doing it. Where's the homework for the let? Well, that's going to be one of the choices. Ah, we'll just, I'm just going to write it up here somewhere. Yeah. Randomly insert <laughs> in the slides. I know. Well, you should just retain everything. It's the, um, all right. So we have uh, two options here, and they're they're actually related to each other, but uh, we can go down the, the path for either of them initially. Um, we can look at how do we take our current language and add the ability for objects to it, or we can go down the path of how do we create uh, kind of block statements where we can have multiple things happen inside of our um, language where we can, you know, define a couple of variables do something with those variables, storing the results someplace else, you know, have several things occur inside of a block. Which one sounds uh, like the next exciting thing you want to tackle? Yeah. 
Would you even listen to the options? You just chose the second one. I listened to the second one and I missed the first one, so I'm gonna go with the second one. Anybody else have an opinion? No, no. I say it once, and it's in the slides. Otherwise, <laughs> Add, adding object-oriented to our language or adding a block expression. We're going to do them both, regardless. Okay. They're both impossible. All right, block expressions. Which ones? <laughs> All right, so uh, if we're thinking about what this is uh, uh, compared to in our traditional languages, you know, if you had a uh, function or the body of a for loop or something like that, whenever we have opening, and closing, curly braces, and then we have stuff in the middle, that's a block expression. So we might want to do something in Java like int a is equal to five, int b is equal to seven, int c is equal to a plus b something like that and then maybe we do something i'll just say like something like print c ish pseudo -cody. all right so that might be something we want to do in a traditional programming language and that's something that scheme makes it very difficult for us to do right but now that and we're implementing our language in scheme and up to this point it's been very similar to scheme in that we're you know, we're kind of purposely choosing uh, function names that aren't the same as schemes, um, but more of just the, to make sure we're kind of differentiating yourself from scheme. But this is something that kind of since day one in here, most of you sort of wanted to do. I think you're going to find out that you didn't, didn't want it as much as you, you thought once we get into it. Um, uh, it just isn't all that compatible the way functional languages work, but we're not necessarily building a functional language. We haven't really given much definition to what no lang uh, no language should be yet. At this point, we're just kind of mimicking a long scheme, but this is something we might want to do. Go ahead. So when you build those perverse structures, right? If you're actually creating the language, mm -hmm. you still like have definition of what you want to do all the time. I don't know that we can just arbitrarily say that's always the case because sometimes it, it probably depends on the size of what you're building if you're building something very very large you certainly want to have some level of game plan it maybe it doesn't have to be as detailed um as you're maybe thinking but you probably want to think about if i want to support this feature i need to make sure it has these three to get to there um, otherwise you go to here like oh i'm missing crap and then when you find out you're missing crap then you have to go back and change other stuff and things like that, which is okay in a class like this where we're wanting to upgrade stuff and and change stuff and see weaknesses in, in old versions, but certainly uh, you'd want to have a pretty good idea. Um, similarly, well, let's say secondarily, especially with interpreters. Uh, so in today's um, technology world, it's very common for places to come out with like the interpreter of the week. Um, and that interpreter is meant to allow you to do something that was otherwise complicated in an easier way. Um, you know, a, a great example of this, and it's, I mean, calling it an interpreter is probably not super, super accurate because it's still built on top of JavaScript. But when you look at all of these JavaScript libraries like, like uh, React, um, uh angular ajax jquery these guys are all um effectively well if you go back to like jquery and ajax those both solve the same problem in kind of a more formal way so ajax allowed you to solve the problem of having portions of your website reload without having to reload the whole site but it was pretty janky jQuery said, oh, let's make this better. But really what it did is it gave you a syntax that made it feel better. But under the hood, the same stuff was happening. Ultimately, a part of the website was rebuilding and JavaScript since day one was maintaining a document object that was your website. So this was just a matter of rewriting portions of the document object. Then we kept growing with that. So it's common for us today to build middleware 
interpreter-ish type things that allow us to accomplish something that maybe the underlying language or technology is already capable of, but in a way that's maybe more user-friendly, more accessible. Um, so with that in mind, I think there is, first of all, those are smaller jobs to solve in the big scheme of things. But also I think that there is some value to kind of letting it organically grow. Um, Cause you might say, okay, well, I use this technology pretty often and these are the five things I always do. So I wanna make these five things convenient for me. I'm gonna write this thing once so that those five things become easier uh, moving forward. Um, and then all of a sudden you might run into the sixth thing <laughs> and then you might have to add that to your language or, or something along those lines. Okay. Um, so question here would be, if we're going to implement this idea of a block expression in our language, chances are it's going to be a list of expressions, right? All right. What's the output going to look like? If we think about this um, as a, I'm just going to steal this. Let's see, block expressions as lists. And here I'll, let's just convert these guys into our, um, so this is our, um, do we call it a var expression? Let's just call it a var expression. Var expression A5, is that what it was? B7. Uh, well, I could leave it like that. There'll be a parsed version, whatever. So technically this is, I pre-parsed these guys. I didn't fully parse this. Um, uh, we don't actually currently have a uh, display, but uh, we could just say boil down to C, or we can just pretend like we're gonna have a, a display for whatever that ends up meaning. All right, so if we were to run this program, what do we expect? the output to be? Well, you're just adding seven and five together, but when I say the output, if you, well, here, let me, let me throw that in there. I think that'll drive you towards what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah. No, yes, maybe. I have this stuff. This is pseudo, pseudo, pseudo. Answer my question. Yeah, but answer the question I asked first, and then we'll ignore the rest of the crap you were saying. <laughs> what do we expect the output to be if you um, use your brain and adjust for the keynote capitalizes something so on me? What would we expect the output of this to be if this was a Java program? So, Two different outputs, right? Two different things to the screen. Up to this point, we've only experienced a single output, right? So how might we in our program represent multiple outputs? Could be a list of outputs. All right, so then what should the output of this guy be? Okay, well, so we need to, and this becomes an interesting thing when you think about us calling our run expression on this, our run expression on this, our run expression on each one of these guys, this guy needs to have a result. He's going to boil down to something. And we know that if we're just adding something into the environment, um, we probably, especially since we're dealing with an environment passing interpreter, he probably needs to boil down to the adjusted environment so that we can then call this guy on that adjusted environment, right? But is there an output to this line? Go ahead. Wouldn't what be five? 
uh, wouldn't this resolve to the value five? You could make that argument. I mean, ultimately, it's it's your language. You could decide what these things resolve to. But if I call run expression on this guy, um, I at the very least expect to have an, an expanded environment, right? Um, probably utilizing something similar to what we did last class, where we were updating a scope in progress, right? Because inside of a block expression, there's, there's a scope associated with this guy, and the A is five and the B is, is, is seven probably should exist in the same scope. We did talk last time that technically you could think have new scopes for every single variable, maybe doesn't make the most logical sense for how scopes work, but we couldn't punch a hole in it, at least at this point. But I would say that we, from a, a language structure perspective, we probably want to say that this guy contains a scope. And that scope has variables in it associated with uh, uh, that scope. So this A equals five and this B equals seven are things that exist inside the same scope, which is the local scope to, uh, uh, to this guy. So we definitely expect to get the environment back from updating this variable. Um, what do we output if we get an environment about back? keeping in mind that when we're outputting stuff how are we outputting it since we're running this entire thing through our run expression we're probably building up a list of outputs like you said so we're going to be consing something onto uh, uh onto this so what do we so when we don't actually expect there to be a visual output we could have some sort of placeholder for a non-visual output. It could, we could say hidden, we could say NA, we could say whatever, but we need to have something that will be that placeholder for it. Now, in the end, we could go back through then and clean it up, right? And say, post-process my output and remove any of the NAs. Well, basically keep anything that isn't NA or keep anything that isn't the word hidden, whatever it is. Um, and that'll be my final output. So we're only seeing the things that were meant for the end user to see. Okay, so we do need to consider that. But this guy produces an updated environment. This guy produces an updated environment. Um, this guy, now really, this is probably the wrong, because in our current language, when we say var expression, our, um, feeling would be to resolve a to its value. So a var expression wouldn't look like that. A var expression would look like this. So we might have a new, maybe a defined var expression where we are effectively saying a is equal to five. Add this to my environment. Add this to my environment. Add that to my environment. Now print out the results of var expression C. Print out the results of var expression A. So var expression A is going to be Yeah, and that's what it currently does for us. Like our current var expression is that guy. He calls resolve. Correct, because this would be defining a variable. And up to this point in our language, defining variables don't make sense. We have the only place a variable can be bound in our language is where? Actually, we have two places. So it can be bound in a let or, or call, call expression. So the lambda mixed in with the call, which that does the two bindings. All right, so now we want to say, look, I want to add something to, you could say we're adding it to the global environment, but the way common languages work is you have this global environment that exists before main. If we kind of go off of all programs beginning in with main, we have this global environment that exists before main. And now I'm creating a new, more local scope to that global scope. 
and that's going to belong to this block expression. Um, uh, now, doing a block expression like this, we also now have created, and this doesn't really change what we were just talking about, but now the body of a function can be a block expression. So we can still honestly say that, well, in our language, all programs are going to begin and end with main. So we will have a call on main, which is so we'll have a function called main, and that guy is going to be where the program begins and ends, something like that. But then we'd have to have the abilities to call other functions and also define other functions. Um, so we'll get to that as we start unraveling uh, this guy. All right, so to start making this work, we need to give ourselves the ability to define a variable and store it in our language, right? And we decided the result of this guy should be the new environment, okay? But now we need to decide when we have a define like this, we are expanding our environment, but where are we putting that variable? Do every single time we hit a define, do we create a brand new scope? Or when we hit a define, do we grab the current scope and add it to that and push that current scope back onto the environment, producing the resulting updated environment? Probably something along those lines. If, if our ultimate goal is to have all variables within a scope living in a single scope rather than scopes on top of each other, which we saw technically would work, but maybe goes a little bit against the logic of how scopes are supposed to work. All right, so let's go and write define. Let's add it to our uh, documentation for our language first. I have that somewhere, right? So maybe we have something called um, define. And this guy is going to take in an identifier as well as a um, no lang expression. So this is the variable name, and its value will be anything that you can create a no lang expression from. Presumably, that boils down to a value. So something that wouldn't probably be a defined um, expression, although well, I guess we wouldn't technically outlaw that right now, because you think about modern programming languages, you can sometimes do weird stuff, right? In this case, if I'm if I'm going to allow for this ability to define a variable and the result of calling that is going to be the new environment, nothing technically, as I have this written, would keep me from saying define A to be equal to the define B is equal to five. So now what I did is I set A equal to an environment. That is the environment that resulted from A or B is equal to five, adding that to it. And now I have an environment, I have a variable in my environment that is another environment. Could be helpful in a situation where you say, look, I'm gonna store this current little stupid environment because later on I might wanna call upon that variable called stupid environment and have a certain function get executed only in that environment. You might want to bypass scope or something like that. Who knows? But technically it would be illegal. It would be legal to do that as I have this written because I'm saying anything that is a no lang uh, expression. If I didn't want that to work, then what I would have to do is I would have to um, have a define live in its own portion of the language so not rather it be rather than it being a no language uh, no language reference or no language expression it would be its own thing similar to what how we wrote boolean expression that way we couldn't have defines inside of defines what do you think what do we want to do the boolean expression is my grammar for boolean we did a no code function expression, so we already have a precedent for this. Yeah, but this is this is just as good. This this guy here. Here's a example where we said we have a no code function expression, 
Um, this guy lives on its own. He's a specialty case. So now when I have my grammar for no code, I can specify in my call that this guy specifically takes this kind of animal. It's not just any old no language expression. It is specifically a no code uh, function expression. So I could have inside of my, um, I could define my define expression or whatever we end up calling it. We could say that that is its own grammar. And that guy specifically takes, you know, it's define identifier and then anything that's a no language expression where a no language expression does not cover define. That's not one of those guys. So if we call this guy a no code define expression, and we say that this guy is the word define symbol to be equal to a no language expression. And I would take it out of here. So this is kind of working like the inverse of what we did before. Before we defined a no code function expression so that we can directly reference only that kind of animal right here in our call. Where in this case, I am defining my own no code define expression language. This is the language of defined expressions of which right now we have one type, but I don't know, we, we could add new ways of defining later on in our language if we wanted to. But we have this no code define expression and this guy, he references no lang expression. So it kind of goes the other direction. So we're not actually referencing no code define expressions anywhere inside of um, our uh, no lang expression yet. We will though, because if we look at our block, there we have my block. Ninja, Ninja. I feel like I need to have a button that just randomizes these. Wouldn't that be good? Nailed it. Almost nailed it. Nailed it. So if I look at my block expression here, which we will be writing soon, what do we see in here? Well, we see a no code defined uh, expression, which is has its own grammar, another no code ex defined expression, another no code defined expression, which contains a no uh, a no code expression in here, a no lang expression, whatever I called it up there. All right. And then a print, we'll have to decide where that guy goes. Presumably print will print out anything that is a no lang expression because you probably wouldn't print out the results of a define expression, just like in Java, you can't say system that out that print lin into a equals five. You can say system out that print lin a, but not the define expression. All right, so really when we create block expressions, the block expression is a define expression or, well, it's zero or more define expressions or no lang expressions as I currently have it written, right? I'm just inventing defined expressions right now because we certainly believe defined expressions need to belong in here. In fact, this guy is almost, defines are almost the reason to have, to have this um, other than just being able to do multiple things in a row, but define is kind of maybe the secret sauce that allows us to start remembering things along the way as we want to accomplish some more, some more complex things or whatever. All right, so a no code defined expression will look like this. So that means we need to write, since we're adding a new language to our code, this is the language of defined expressions. We're going to need a parser and we're going to need a, uh, um, uh, its own interpreter, right? Okay. So come in here, 
Uh, actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and finish fleshing out what our language should have. All right, so I'm gonna just put a note on here, not defined yet. All right. So then in our no language reference, we want to have the ability to print and we also need a block uh, expression, okay? So we'll create a couple of those guys. So we're gonna have a print a no language expression, something like that, okay? This just allows us to do the output, you can call it display, you can call it print, whatever we wanna do, we can modify that later if we, we want to. Um, I'll just throw a couple things next to it just to remind us what we have not added to our language yet. Um, and then the last one is going to be a block um, structure. Uh, which actually does exist in Scheme. Scheme has something called a begin uh, a, a begin function that allows you to have multiple things in uh, a row. But I think what you're going to see from this is, and you've already seen from working with Scheme, is in the early days of writing stuff in Scheme, you kind of wanted to do that because that was your preconceived notion of how programming worked. But now you've maybe bumped into this idea of that kind of doesn't make sense because everything we've been doing is this rec recursively specified data. We have functions calling itself where I don't know what I would do with a block to have multiple outputs. Every now and then we've had a couple of run-ins here. We would say, you know, it would kind of be helpful to be able to update a variable somewhere else in my code. And that's actually possible in Scheme as well through a function called set, uh, set bang, set exclamation point. Um, that does allow you to do that. Um, but in the context of an environment passing interpreter, that's sort of kind of cheating. Um, that isn't to say you would never do it. It just because we're writing a specific type of interpreter that pa passes environments around, going outside of that, bypassing passing the environment to update an environment is sort of kind of cheating. It's also dangerous because if you update an external global variable in some part of your code when that should go away after the current recursive call, you might have trouble changing it back where you can have multiple versions of the environment kind of be in limbo as part of your recursive calls uh, in our current implementation, where maybe you call something with an updated environment like an alet, and then when you come back out, you're, you're stuck with the previous environment that was not extended. And you didn't have to do anything special to accomplish that. That was just handled for you by recursion. When you made your original recursive call, the environment was equal to this. You make a new recursive call where you extended the environment. As long as that call was ex existed, that new environment was there, but as soon as that guy died, you were back to their previous environment. And if you had a, uh, a block thing in there, that's gonna be pretty beneficial for us to be able to revert back to previous environments and then do more stuff, if that was something we wanted to do. So effectively what we're doing here is we are adding to our language the ability to do procedural language type things where at this point we've only done things that are part of functional programming languages which were kind of foreign to us when we started this class but is now kind of the way we think in this class so now we're going to start transitioning back to maybe thinking a little bit more like a traditional programmer twisting our language to start working more like that kind of language but we're writing it inside of a functional language and then we'll transition to how do we now build on top of that the idea of an object oriented language and you'll see that that's not really a big deal because we'll just have to we'll think about it in terms of java when you learned it initially to java when you wrote objects in it you'll see what's the differences okay so we're going to have a print 
And then we need a, a block statement. And this guy is going to have a list of Um, actually, let me write it like this. This is going to be a no lang expression or a uh, what I call the no lang defined expression, no code defined expression. And tactically, we'll say you can have zero or more of those. If you really wanted to create an empty block, Java opening curly brace, closing curly brace, and put nothing in there, you, you could. Not overly useful, but it's something that you could do. All right, so this is our, oh, what, what's, what's that guy called there? This, this line, what's this whole thing called? And then what's this individual line in this thing called? What's this, what kind of animal is this whole thing we have right here? Overall, it's the grammar, good. You're not wrong, I'd probably give you points. But it, formally, what do we call it? Production. production. Yep, so this is a single production and it is a rule. So that's not horrifically off base. I mean, it's not like some of the crap Jason was spouting out earlier. Did you look it up in the notes? Came out of your mind? A lot of people get lucky every now and then. Clocks, clocks right twice a day. <laughs> oh, by the way, were you thinking about applying for Acuity's internship? Oh, it's not till... Email Jordan. Jordan. I think you'll... It'll be receptive. Are you thinking about it? Okay. Email Jordan. <laughs> hey, sometimes things happen. Carbon copy me when you email both of you. I don't care. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. These two might be interested in the fact that the internship is in the advertising business. Yeah, there are things that get advertised for. And then there are other things that they might be looking for that they don't necessarily publicly hire for. And at the very least, it's worth having a conversation with folks to get on their radar for maybe next time. What are you gonna say? So for the uh, statement, what do you want it to do? It's up to you. What do you want it to do? Okay, that kind of makes sense what, what print should do, but one of the things we'll have to look at when we go and do that is what is a um you know, what is a what does it mean to display in scheme in the context of our block expressions kind of a, no well right now we don't even have a thing that's called returning we just boil down to yeah so we're going to have to dictate what that is All right. But in any case, for right now, block expression is either of those types zero or more times. Okay. And this guy is not defined yet. All right. Well, we can't do a block yet, but we can do print first or we can do define first. Print's not going to take very long, okay? Um, but print does then have this uh, um, interesting uh, dilemma. As uh, Emily pointed out, um, right now, when we run our code, so for instance, our current example code, when we run this guy, it boils down to just a number. Two. Well, did that print or did that boil down to that? Or does that not really mean anything in our current language? Because we don't have the ability to print. We also don't have the ability to return. So you kind of go back to when we were first talking about programming, 200, let's say, 
when we talked about writing functions and does this function display something or does this function return something? Well, neither of those things currently truly exist in our language. Our language boils down to a value and it ends up on the screen regardless of whether we returned it or not. But now that's going to change since we have block, um, we're going to have block expressions which allow for line one to potentially impact line two. Therefore, returning values to a defined um, function could be handy. Okay, so we'll we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Um, but one interesting thing here is is this guy is boiling down to two now in scheme. I think it's called display. Yeah. So if you call the display function, do you notice that guy is now purple? It's a purple two instead of a blue two. Well, it's yeah, yeah. It's a different color than this guy, at the very least. So what would happen if I cons display two onto the empty list? So explain to me what happened there. My output was a purple two followed by a list with a void in there. This is a single value. That's not a list containing the word void. That's a single value void. Go ahead. Okay, so kind of two separate things happen, right? Display, this guy right here, calls some thread, some other thread of execution, which ultimately spits out purple two. This is something that isn't a value that was usable as part of the cons. This was something that the interpreter did. It didn't give us a value, it was a, it was a behavior, um, an action that the interpreter performed, which was put this value on the screen. And they've differentiated it based on the color of the value here. Super obvious, right? Um, especially if you were colorblind, this would be very difficult. Yeah. Are you colorblind? So, like what, like all colors or? Uh, mainly, blue and... <laughs> mainly blue and purple. <laughs> Those look identical to me. <laughs> it's not going to mean all that much uh, for what we're doing here. I think you'll be uh, fine just thinking about, uh, um, huh? So does then VR suck? Um, what's the sky outside look like to you? Yeah. Oh, the real sky. So what happens if you watch a video of the Northern Lights? If it's because the northern lights are, I think they're always green, at least to, to me. They can be different colors? Oh, so you would see a green sky with blue northern lights when I might see a blue sky with green northern lights. It's, it's, it's something. All right, so what went down here? Two different things. This guy right here told the interpreter to perform an action, not boil down to a value, perform an action. Now it did boil down to a value as well, because anytime we have a function call, a function does boil down to the value, the value of what that function did. And what did this function do? It did nothing in terms of a value. So this display function did boil down to nothingness. And then I conned nothingness onto the empty list, giving myself the list containing one element that is nothingness, void, null. You can think of it however you want. This thing here was a secondary line, uh, thread of execution that the interpreter put something onto the screen for us. Go ahead. Can you put the word void here? Can you 
Uh, you could probably put the word void. I think you'd have to do that. But the question is, can you cons void onto a list? Because that's probably, is that a reserved word? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be screaming about it too much. I don't know what you do with it, but go ahead. Uh, is this guy considered a list? Well, let's look at our actual output up here. So assuming that this is some kind of special version of void, are you asking, is that a list? Yeah. Well, we can find out pretty quick. Yep, so car, um, oh, actually, hold on. Yeah, see, so void is the parenthesis void parenthesis is not a list. It's its own special thing, because what I did here is I created a list out of whatever boiled down from display, which was the value void. And when I did car of that, it didn't give me an error. So it did give me the first element of that list, which was nothingness and nothingness interpreted on the screen is nothing. Uh, maybe an interesting. Is that true? I don't see. And that does not come out as null uh, either. Nothingness is not, um, does not equate to null. Uh, then maybe there's a predicate specifically for, for that, like a void predicate or it might just not make sense. I don't know I don't know when we'd ever use it. I'm guessing this doesn't exist. Oh, no it does. Ninjad. All right. I don't know how we'd use that at this point, but it's it's a thing. All right. So in any case, this was the important thing up here that we saw when we did this, we saw that this guy here did two things. He did boil down to nothingness, but he also instructed the interpreter to put something onto the screen. If we rely on that ability, we're gonna have some fairly funky output to our, uh, um, uh, our block. When we said our block would be like a list of values, a list of, of resolved values. So I'm thinking that for us, printing or displaying, however you want to think about it, rather than it actually calling the internal codes, um, you know, display function, uh, there's another one. I think there's print that puts it like in a box. And there's one of them that actually builds a big purple box and puts the value in it, but doesn't really matter. Any one of those is calling something that we don't have control over. The interpreter is doing its own thing. And I think that then is going to give us some weird output. Well, we'll have you know, our block statement with a list of results. Some of them are void, but then we'll have these purple numbers interjected in our output, not even in the list, just there. All right, so I would say that when we display something, we probably want to have just some sort of representation of this was displayed to the screen. And we can decide what that looks like. Um, you know, we could put a little asterisk screen and then what the thing was and end it in asterisk or something like that, or just start it with an asterisk screen. And then that'll remind us that, oh, this was printed out rather than using the built-in thing. All right, so let's go down to our, well, I don't have too much space here. 
That's our Boolean expression parser, a no code function in parser. Here's our no parser. All right, so we are going to look at and what do we want our function name to be for uh, display? Do you want it to be display? Do you want it to be print? Spit, spit out. I like that. Spit out. All right, so there's spit out. So what do we do if we are going to spit something out? Well, we're going to produce a list. So maybe we decide it's gonna be, a, the result will be a list since we're doing a couple of different uh, things. So we'll create a list containing um, maybe star, screen, star, something like that. And then whatever no parser. Uh, actually, hold on. This is going to be the execution thing of it. So really, I need to call this a spit out expression. Yeah. Followed by whatever no parser returns for the catter of our no code. That guy right there. So then in our interpreter, Spit out expression. If that's what I'm looking at, then what do we do? We call, well, we'll create a list star screen star, something like that. Hopefully, that the asterisks in there are allowed to start a string, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. And then run parsed code on the catter of parsed no code. And yeah, thank you. Run parse code, passing at that same environment. All right. So now what we can do is we can have Let's define sample spit out code. This will be spit out a two. Make sure this guy looks the way we want it to look. Yep, so there's our parsed version of it, and there's the output. Screen two. All right. So next, we need to create our define language. So we need a parser and a interpreter for that guy. So very similar to what we did up here for our Boolean expression parser. 
we will define our define expression parser. This guy will be a lambda that will take in a define expression. And these guys come in one flavor <laughs> currently. I did do like an error message. Yeah, I did an error message for that. So we'll do it in a con just like we did for the Boolean, even though we really could do it just in if else, but this will give us future flexibility in case we decide to have more forms of our define, whatever. So a con, we can have equal the car of define expression. If that guy is equal to spit out. No, hold on, that's my print. Uh, what are we doing with define? Anything clever? Define who? That's what the parse version of it will be. But do we have anything clever for our how we define? How about a remember? will remember something. So this guy should be a remember expression. So if I'm looking at the word remember, then what am I going to do? Well, a remember, if I look at my grammar, a remember says it's going to be a symbol, and then it's going to be whatever my parser for my no code expression returns, whatever we call that parser. So we're going to boil down to a list containing remember exp, containing the car of the cutter of my remember expression, which is going to be my variable name. That's my symbol. Followed by whatever, uh, um, what's my parser down here called? No parser. I'm lost. Followed by whatever no parser returns for the car of the cutter cutter of remember expression. So if I see a remember build remember expression with the variable name and whatever no parser returns for the no code expression that is the CADDR of that guy. Car of the cutter. Car of the cutter cutter. So we need to call um, no parser on that guy. Everybody good with that? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have my else for my error, error statement like I did down here. Not a valid remember expression. So there's our remember expression parser. Define run 
parsed remember expression. To be a lambda, it's going to take in a parsed remember expression. As well as the current environment. Okay. And at the very least, what are we going to do? Well, we need to, I'm going to create a let here to give me my pieces. So we know the kind of value we're dealing with here, right? We already know we're dealing with a remember expression because that's what this guy does. So we only have one um, form of that. We could still do it in a cond if I wanted to. So we could say uh, equal par parsed remember expression. This might just read a little better for later on. If that guy is equal to what I just call it, remember or remember exp. This dude. So if he's equal to that, remember exp, then I'm going to create a let. And inside this let, I'm going to remember a couple of things. I'm going to remember the uh, variable name. So var name will be the catter of my parsed remember expression. And then var value will be whatever run parsed code returns on the CADDR of parsed remember expression. In the current environment. All right, so then the body of the let, the job of run parse remember expression is to boil down to an environment. All right, so how do we boil down to an environment? Let's go, well, the presumption is that uh, this guy is going to be updating the most local scope, right? So maybe update environment with scope and progress. This guy do what I need it to do. So this takes an environment, a list of variables, a list of corresponding values, and he will spit out the correct environment for me. One thing I don't think I currently do is it ever correct to update the global environment? I think the answer is probably no. So we can make the assumption that we're always inside of a more local scope than global. The only reason I say that that's worth considering is we have this little special word in front of our global environment that might get extended a little bit differently. Um, but I think we can always assume that there is a more local um, scope. It might initially require us to throw an empty scope on front of the global scope. When we get into it, we'll see uh, where this goes. Okay, where was I at? All right, so this guy is going to boil down to update environment with scope and progress. 
and he's going to take a list of values, a list of name, variable names. So I'll create a list out of my var name, a list out of my var value. So there's my list of variable names, my list of variable values, and then the current environment. And he should boil down to an environment with an updated scope. So now down here in run code or run parse code, this guy. If I'm looking at a guy, whose car is a remember expression. Then what do I want to do? I want to call run parsed remember expression. on that parse no code in the current environment. Remember a 14 oh you're right now we do need to add the ability for our we need to teach our no parser to make sure he passes it off to the other other parser So here's my no parser. If I'm looking at a remember. I need to call my remember expression parser. on no code. Okay, so the hope is this guy gives us, and notice I did go up to my environment here. What environment am I using? ENV, here's my ENV right here. I am gonna need a more local scope. So this is kind of like the scope for main that currently has nothing in it. Uh, already take the global into consideration oh yeah you're right it does it tax on a new global scope or a new local scope if we're not uh, uh currently building on one okay so it still will give us that new scope it won't be extending global but we did put that in there for so if it was the first value we were uh, adding to the thing it would still work all right so there's my environment there's my parse no code But received. Second argument must be a list, but I gave it. This definitely gave us our remember expression. So 
if we have a remember expression, first element is that. Oh, I gave it the wrong order. And that's in my run. That guy. So there's my extended scope. Oh, yeah. So maybe it didn't do what he said it was going to do. Let me just throw that on there for now. See if that does what we wanted it to do. Yeah, that guy does. So for now, we'll just throw in our scope. We can always fix that later, but that gives us something to work with. All right, so for your homework, Oh, whatever. I'm going to put it up on Blackboard anyways. Homework. Add block expression to our language, which allows for any number of no code or remember expressions and boils down to a list of results. Let's put it to the code and the self eval. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, I'll see everybody on Tuesday. I want to put up the current uh, code on Slack. Oh, I think you're just doing that because I don't know anything about it.